Well, that was uh, John Robert interviewing uh, Betty Boo about a new single and her fantastic adventures in the world of pop. So uh, I guess we'll start with the new single. I mean, how, how do you how do you just sort of switch back in into that after after all that time? I don't know. It must be. I don't know. I must be mad first of all. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's sort of um, it's all coming back to me now. You know, talking to lots of people, especially after being isolated and stuff, and uh, not talking to anybody really apart from the family. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. I love it. I mean, you got. I mean, you lost the news and you found the news again. I mean, I mean, there was, I mean, in your own life, it was difficult because your mother wasn't well, etc. And I don't mm. understand how that would get in the way of the news. But how do you? How do you rediscover it again after that amount of time? I think it's one of those things you're walking down a muddy country road and a tune came into your head, or did you have to graft it a bit? Oh, I did. I had to dig deep, actually, if I'm really honest, um, to get back into, first of all, um, I suppose, being this being me, Alison, and then it's being Betty Boo, which is, you know, it's a bit of escapism and there's a t- style to what I do. Um and because I was writing songs for other people, I sort of not, I wouldn't say blanded out. <laughs> I was just, it didn't do what I usually do, what's in my, what I do naturally. And uh, and I had to really kind of rediscover myself, I suppose. But I was really lucky because I found uh, a great co-writer and co-producer in Andy Wright. He's just the best. And I don't know where he's been all my life, to be honest with you. He's he's just so great. And we we get on so well. In fact, we knew each other back in the 90s. I used to um, have an apartment above Metropolis Studios in Chiswick. And he had a studio in, in Metropolis. So I used to see him all the time. And, you know, um, so I, I was familiar with his work and everything. But we never actually worked together. But his background is in... Um, you know, programming beats and things like that, because he did loads of stuff with uh, Massive Attack back in the day. And he was the he was the go to sort of programmer. And this, that's the kind of style of writing I like, where you start off like that with um, some inspiration, like, you know, getting some break beats together and the bass line. And, and that's how we started. And it, I kind of it rekindled how I actually write, do my stuff. So it might start with a little bit of a rap and and then it'll sort of build from there really um but he's he I think he was the guy that I, I've been waiting for <laughs> to work with that's interesting you actually start with the beat you start the rhythms and build the melodies on top because yeah. I would assume you might do I know a lot of people do that but I would assume you do it the way around just because it was because it is very melodic what you do yeah um I think I because I think maybe it's my rap background is it starts off like that anyway so it could be just a cadence um, or something where, you know, I've got this little kind of chant in my head and then it can turn into something melodic. Um, but I, I just like the way something if some, something quite interesting can come from that rather than something that is kind of conventional, I suppose. Um, so I like I like timings of things and uh, and, you know, I'm just they're quite intricate, actually, like doing the do raps are quite quite uh an intricate rap really um not so much where are you baby but i managed to rhyme silly words with other silly words <laughs> so <laughs> you know, i just have fun with it <laughs> yeah i mean there is a lot of fun in the music and it's very playful and is that yeah. something you really i mean is that is that just how you are anyway or is that just something you really wanted to put there because it's how you define personally a great pop song um well i like to when i like listening to records i like to have i like to feel uplifted personally um I'm not like one of the those sort of Bridget Jones types that (laughs) things I can't live without you you know and with a bottle of wine and stuff like that I'm not that kind of person um but I suppose you know I mean I I'm not uh personally I'm a quite a shy person and uh quite miserable bit of a misery guts (laughs) mostly so maybe it's me just stepping outside myself to give myself a boost yeah, well, literally a beast. That's, there's a pun there, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, so when you step back into it now, is, is, is this like um, a more mature version of it? Or is it, is it very much back in that little sort of, you know, the Betty Boo planet of, of years ago? <laughs> um, I think, do you know, I've always said that 
it just came out of nowhere actually I said somebody asked me actually it was Terry Paul my you know public publicist uh, can't even say it <laughs> publicist <laughs> and uh, I said you know it's just it's the sort of records I would have made when I was 25 when I gave up and I think there are definite I mean there are elements in there that are just kind of where where I was in 1995 um Beats, uh, samples, a um, bit of rap, a bit of me- melody. This time, I think there's a lot more instrumentation because Andy's a great musician um, and he, he plays everything so well. So we were able to maybe, maybe perhaps it's less naive, perhaps um, maybe more, more grown up in its music, but it's still got that um, fun mm-hmm. sort of, innocent flavor I think um I don't know if, <laughs> because I'm 50 coming up to 52 I don't know if that's a great thing but you know it's where I am you know it's just what's what was there um you know I'm not trying to be anyone else just me and uh you know I, I've really enjoyed it it's been really cathartic actually and I really didn't think honestly I didn't think I would be able to do it actually if I'm honest I thought mm. perhaps Oh, maybe one or two songs, see how it goes, put it out there. Um, but, you know, an album later, actually nearly two albums later, here I am, you know. So it's great to be able to do it with some wisdom and, you know, some hindsight. And, you know, when you're young, you don't really appreciate that much. <laughs> you just think that life is just, um, you know, uh, what's the word? You, just don't, you don't really think about tomorrow. You just, you just, you never think, you don't think, you think if you're going to be in your 50s, you just, that's like, well, that's like your nan's age, isn't it? You know, it's not, you don't think of it like anything else other than that. And, um, but, you know, here I am still in my 90s clothes. Um, I just love it. <laughs> well, I was speaking to a friend of mine the other day, and he's got um, a teenage daughter, and he's saying what you're doing and kind of stuff you're doing is actually really striking a chord with people 13, 14 years old, it's like it's either it's eternal or it's come back around again. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think there is. Um, it's funny because I've got friends who've got children that are in their, their, you know, their teenagers and stuff, and they didn't know what I was I used to do back in the day. And um, when they've watched it on YouTube, they were like, really? God, that's really good. <laughs> that's really different. That's really. And it's still kind of, I don't know, that it, they seem to like it. And uh but I think I've always been fascinated with um, f- with samples and trying to reimagine them. For instance, um, it was records over the years. Say, for instance, um, Madonna was hung up, but she used um, ABBA, and she managed to put a song over the top of that. I just thought that's really clever, actually, because you know it takes you. Com- you don't really think of the ABBA song; you think of her song. Um, another example would be. Um, uh, Sugar Babes with Gary Newman when they did Freak Like Me and it you know I think it's it's sort of perhaps it's my hip-hop background where you just d- discover records all the time to try and sample and um, and you know and it, it sort of does lead you down to a, a you know a different genre so for instance you know I could have been really into back in the day I could have been into just like Duran Duran and um, Spandau Ballet but actually with rap music and hip hop and, no, and, no, and knowing DJs and things, they would listen to Julian Cope records, like World Shut Your Mouth or um, Led Zeppelin, the beginning of, um, oh, uh, what's that song? You know, the, dun, 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 dun. yeah, <laughs> you know, you were able to go and find new music. And I've always been fascinated with that. Um, and uh, maybe that's how, you know, if I can bring stuff round, I suppose, I suppose using the Human League sample, which, by the way, I we wrote the song first and then plonked the sample in afterwards because it, we thought we'd have a bit of fun with it and it, it just stuck. So um, that's, that's interesting. That's almost like the other way around. It's not. I mean, most people use a sample purely as a whole inspiration, but you're using it as a texture. Yeah, exactly, and that, that's not, you're absolutely right. Textures are, are are brilliant. I love using textures and and. The stuff I did at the beginning with my first album, Boomania, for instance, doing the do, I mean, I used um, uh, Red Parata and Adele Ron's sample, Captain of My Ship, and we sped it up about, I think it's twice the speed or something, so it sounded completely different. And 
um, kind of cartoony. Um, yeah, I've always loved doing stuff like that. And I think that I think that will always be something I'd want to do when I write stuff so it doesn't sound too ordinary. I like things to just be stepped up a little bit. So in a way, you've always sort of played with pop music, like, you know, either with samples or the imagery or the ideas of it. Yeah. No, I do. I love... Um, I mean, I, I've been getting into DJing recently. I've got, um, like, a pioneer a couple of decks and stuff like that and just mixing stuff up is really interesting I just love it just you know it, it helps you it, t- it takes you to another place completely um and uh technology so good these days I mean in the old days I mean when I had my sampler Akai 950 you know I had to re- it was so hard there's no logic to it at all <laughs> you know and nowadays it's just like just use this you know and use my garage band or whatever or you know whatever we've got to just loop stuff up or speed it up put some effects on there you know it's great you can experiment loads i mean that's another really interesting thing about what you've done is i mean yeah it's pure pop and it's fantastic pop it's also very diy and initially you were actually in your bedroom like very very amateur very diy very lo-fi just making your own songs like classic indie kind of way really yeah i mean it was I didn't know many people that were doing that because what's what I wanted to do is I just wanted to experiment a little bit and not rely on having to find DJs to work with who could just, you know, cut stuff up, cut beats up and things. And uh, I just thought, oh, I just will do it myself. <laughs> just, I thought that's what you did. Um, but, you know, that's a great apprenticeship for me, I think, to know, you know, to know that you can, anything was possible, really especially being signed to an indie label, it was really, it was really good because they just let me get on with it. And um, that was, you know, under the mute umbrella, that's what, you know, Daniel Miller wanted to do with all his artists. And uh, he always had a trust kind of with them, didn't he? And Depeche Mode and Vince Clark and stuff like that. So um, I think they really believed in me and, uh, and, you know, it's good. It was like a little family at the time. And, um, but if I was signed to a major, a major would never, they wouldn't have touched me. They wouldn't, they thought rap was a bit of a fad probably, or maybe just, you know, it was t- too high risk. Um, but look at it now. It's like, I mean, I made, I was always wanting, I always wanted to make pop rap because I'd already done the kind of hardcore, yeah, with a really hard sort of crew and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I um, you know, I was always, I just wanted to make, I love Phil Collins when I was growing up and stuff like that. just pop, just appreciating, you know, what goes into it. I mean, when you listen to stuff from the eighties, for instance, when, you know, synths were introduced into music and stuff, the in the instrumentation and the kind of all the accents are, are in sort of, say, for instance, I was listening to, what was I listening to? Like an Alison Moyet record, for instance, you know, you remember all the bits as, not necessarily singing bits, but all the keyboard parts and things like that, you know, whether you, whether you like it or not, it's in there in the internal jukebox somewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's just, that's where I wanted to go. I even liked uh, Stock Aiken and Waterman as well when I was growing up. I um, was fascinated with what they did. Um, it, that ended up kind of being a bit sort of samey towards the end. But when they did stuff with Don the Summer, and Lonnie Gordon and Sybil and stuff like that. You know, the music's really good. They were all, almost like Northern Soul records, but brought up to date, weren't they? And, um, mm. and uh, yeah, it's probably, not, most pe- people probably don't like them, but <laughs> I just think, you know, you listen to uh, better, better the Devil You Know, such a good record, such a good song. Um, yeah, I think in the pre-sampling period, I guess what they were doing is bringing yeah. the records in they wanted to copy and... Mm and reinvented them as pop records. I mean, yeah, it's a lot cleverer than people like to think, isn't it? Yeah, and I think, you know, with Pete Waterman's um, uh, experience as a DJ in the Midlands, you know, and having records being imported from America and then seeing people's reactions on the dance floor, you know, it really did give him, you know, I think it's, I think we all have have experienced um, inspiration from, music being imported you know if you hadn't heard anything before it's if it sounded fresh you know um 
you know, we I used to get um, imports from America on hip hop records and stuff. I didn't mind paying through the nose for it. You know, it was just you could if you had it. I mean, for instance, I had um, the cool, um, cool, hot and vicious or hot, cool and vicious album by Salt and Pepper, and I bought that on import played it to death and it was just enough to eat. It was just like, oh, this is from America. Oh, wow. <laughs> would they be a key influence in the early days for what you were doing? Oh, most definitely. I mean, because they were, they were so different and the way they delivered their raps and everything was so, it was, I mean, they were just, oh, the, the lyrics were brilliant. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if they wrote them or not. I think Herbie Lovebug might have written them. But um, but the, how they performed it, and they were just so exotic to me. Um, and no, I mean in the old days, nobody now nowadays you'd say, oh, I want to go and see Adele in concert in America, and you'd get a, you'd book a flight and stuff. But in those those days, nobody went to America. <laughs> you couldn't go there for a hundred quid, could you? You know, yeah. it was um, from as far as I I knew, these were like ain't you know people from another planet you know they were just so special um and the same with a lot of uh, artists that i loved like um beastie boys and stuff like that I mean, well, were these points when you decided to try rap yourself and make it to, into your version of pop music i mean how, how how do you do that before you even set up as a diy thing in the bedroom is it, is it actually just wrapping your mates in the shopping center or, or those, <laughs> yeah, those, well, I know with the guitar, you don't get guitar, learn a few chords, but how do you learn to rap? Well, this is it. I mean, I don't know. I think I think what I did is I memorised all the my favourite raps and even really complicated ones like Big Taddy Kane and everything, Raw, and those records, I just studied them, I suppose, and because I just loved, I just it did, it made me feel great being able to do that and... I think my first rap was probably Sucker MC, Sucker MCs by Run DMC, because it was it was slow, but you were able to get the beat right and it felt really good. And also I had friends that were beatboxers. So, you know, that was kind of DIY in its own way. And going around to DJ's houses where they had two decks and, you know, you could actually have your mic, go on the mic and record it on a cassette and, and sort of freestyle a little bit was um, that was like an introduction to performing I guess and you had to really be really good I mean if you, and then you know we started started to do hip-hop jams in front of people you know you couldn't <laughs> you couldn't be rubbish because <laughs> people just boo you off stage and stuff like that so um I did do some sort of rap stuff with um like Tim Westwood used to put on these big hip-hop jams in London and uh and me and my crew at the time, she rockers. We used to go up there on stage and start rapping, and um, but it was a really, it was almost like punk in a way, you know, where it was a an identity. You know, you dressed a certain way, just being part of a, a group, um, and it was different to everybody else, you know, because it wasn't, you know, rap music wasn't heard, being heard on the radio, you know, not all. Well, we had pirate radio living in West London and stuff. Had LWR and Kiss FM actually before it became mainstream. Um, and that was the only way you could hear that sort of music. Although there was a show, um, a, a DJ called Dave Pierce used to be on London radio and he used to have a show, hip hop show every Friday. Um, and that was good because he'd, he'd have all the imports and play the latest hip hop tunes and he used to tune into that. I mean, what was it like uh, being girls in that world? Because it was a very uh, male world at that time. Probably actually still is actually rap, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I suppose so, yeah. Um, I think we were pretty much well-respected, actually, because I think it was such a hard... I mean, we had um, we had beef with another rap crew. <laughs> that was standard issue then. <laughs> it used to, like, go... You know, it was an inspiration for raps where you'd say, "Oh, I hate the way you dress." Uh, you know, really childish stuff. You know, <laughs> <laughs> all this and just uh, it was a source of inspiration, really, to to write raps. But that was the nature of um, getting up on up on stage and rapping and sort of it's almost like roasting, really. You know, that's what it was like. Um, but it's just stupid. <laughs> Looking back, it's so childish and silly. 
And then you met Public Enemy, which at the time uh, was, it seems, quite a bizarre connection. You know what I mean? Now, the Public Enemy were almost kind of respectable in a way. But then they were like, this, you know, the, uh, the heaviest group you could possibly meet, weren't they? And I you know, ended they up were... Professor Griff come round to your house working on your music and... I just think it's really odd. <laughs> <laughs> it was really odd, but seriously, it was mental. You know, we had some enemy um, uh, reporters come round because he needed somewhere to do some interviews. <laughs> so my mum said, yeah, you can do them here if you want. <laughs> and, he was, and they were questioning him about, you know, because he was sort of really quite militant at the time. And I just thought it was just, you know, just a bit of, that's the way they were. You know, you don't really understand the actual, um, I think he's a bit mental. I think he's a bit crazy, actually. But um, but he thought my mum was all right, white and Caucasian. <laughs> she said, you know, like, he said, no, she's all right. <laughs> While she's making a cup of tea for the journalists and stuff. <laughs> so silly, really. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a really bizarre image, like Professor Griff being in suburban London. Yeah, it's about the time he got the sack right, for Public Enemy as well. For what he was saying, yeah, he was a bit mouthy, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but Chuck D was very encouraging, wasn't he? He took you to New York, he, he, he told you to go out and do the music on your own yeah. and things as well, didn't he? So, a very empowering figure, yeah. No, definitely. I think, um, for me, it was just because their, their image was so strong as well. I, he, he just said that, um. You know, if you're, gonna, you're gonna if you're gonna make an impact, you've got to be different. Don't be like anyone else. You know, and that's that, that's really good advice, isn't it? Um, and I I always because I always like pop music, and I think I grew up with the things I liked as a kid. You know, and I I said this the other day to somebody that um, I think my fascination with um, you know being sort of larger than life and being cartoony or wearing silver stuff and silver boots and things is because when I was fascinated with Top of the Pops and, um, you know, I think it's when we got a colour television when glam rock came out and, you know, everything seemed so much bigger and and more exciting um, and bright and fun. And I think that probably goes down deep into why I wanted to be like that or my videos be spacey and things like that. Um, and uh, at that time, it just seemed like a natural thing to do. It just, just, it was, it was very organic, as they say. <laughs> this is an accelerated when, when you start going solo and doing your own thing, creating the Betty Boo. Mm. Sorry, I lost you a bit there. Oh yeah, so this is something that, um, that, that happened more when you went solo. You did the mm. Betty Boo thing, and you sort of mm. went into your glam space sort of style musically and sort of yeah yeah no I, lo- I loved it it was it just seemed like a natural thing honestly it was just I don't know I was just I had people making me clothes I used to design stuff and actually I'd look on the catwalk because at the time um people like Pac Raban and um uh Thierry Mugler actually as well he's actually he's actually quite naff but at this time he had like a lot of silver stuff so I used to just um Asked this girl in uh, Carnaby Street to copy some of the stuff and make it out of silver leather and make some hot pants. And I also loved uh, Red or Dead, which had a spacey theme as well. And I wore a lot of their stuff. They had Space Baby, which was, uh, yeah, I just loved everything that they made because they was they thought outside the box as well. Um, and it really went well with what I was doing. Mm. And then, and then the whole thing really works. It, it, you know, there were hits, weren't there? And it was, you're right in the middle of the, the pop spectacle. I mean, what was that like? It's, it's quite a different world from just being in the bedroom doing <laughs> DIY rap. Yeah, it was a bit of a, I was being, it was like being catapulted into like this other world. Um, but I, you know, I've kind of, I don't know, I just, once I did the Top of the Pops with the Beatmasters in 1989, I was 19. And I thought I'd made it then, you know, it was like, I, I lived in Shepherd's Bush. I live around the corner from BBC Television Centre. So, you know, to be able to go there and just go, actually, I had a car pick me up or somebody arranged for a car to pick me up and it was literally get in the car. And it was like one minute. <laughs> so I felt, that felt a bit poncy. But, um, 
<laughs> it uh, it was uh, it was yeah that was surreal. And also, we used to grow up with um, seeing pop stars in our local park because they'd go and do press shots whilst they were doing to top of the pops and things. So um, I used to see people like Shawadi Wadi and um, you know we saw Depeche Mode once. Um, and that, you know, you'd see all these. Oh, and actually, the the Jacksons, because um, we, my my primary school was on Lime Grove, and Lime Grove Studios was the other studio to the BBC, and um, I, we saw them in a car. As I was coming outside. I was leaving school. My mum and dad picked me up, and then we saw the the Jacksons in the car <laughs> going up to Lime Studios, and it was Lime Road. Um, Lime Grove, sorry. And uh, yeah, that was really surreal. But I kind of had this, this dream that I might be on top of the box one day, maybe. And uh, um, but it was great. Uh, I felt like it was very disappointing, though, when you got there and seen these tiny stages. Have you ever been? Have you been to the studios? No, I've been to all the ones, but never there. But all people always say it was really small. And the people yeah. who were dancing kind of got prodded in the back and made to dance. And it was. <laughs> It's not glamorous at all. Yeah. No, it is. There was about like you could get about 10, 15 people in there and they pushed them around like sheep with like cardboard, <laughs> pushing them around and things. So funny. So, so in, in a way, you have to pretend even more that you're sort of an intergalactic pop star in this kind of cold <laughs> bar. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. You really had to bring it. You had to go, you know, think oh, it, this is a glamorous place. It is, and I thought it was a bit like a like a, a Russian prison in there. To be honest, it was so cold and very concretey. If let's say there wasn't anything aesthetic in there, and mm. um, I, I used to have to smuggle my make hair and makeup in because in those days, I don't know if it's the same now, but because of the unions and everything, you had to use their hair and makeup people, and you weren't allowed to bring your own. So I used to say that they were my assistants and stuff like that. So I didn't want to look, end up looking like Sue Lawley. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because that's what you would have ended up if you had them do your hair and your makeup. It would, you know, you'd look like a newsreader because that's all they did. Um, it's really weird, wouldn't it? Because I mean, if you're doing pop properly, the, the image and the styling is that as important as the music. So why would they let somebody else do it? Yeah, no, exactly. Um, but I think it was a, just a tight unit then. Um, but, you know, it's gone now, finished. <laughs> it's a Soho yeah. house or something, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a very different world you've returned to. So <laughs> what's it on top of a studio that you, when you were living there, that you'd be rehearsing with people like the Lars downstairs? Or was that somewhere else? Oh, yeah, that was somewhere else, actually. I had a studio. I should have had a studio in the Metropolis. In fact, I was offered one. Um, but it was far too expensive. I mean, it was thousands or something. But I found another studio around the corner called Eden, which was a more of an indie um, studio in Chiswick. And uh, the large used to be there. And John Leckie was um, like a almost like a resident um, producer there. So he, we'd always have C bands there and ones that he was interested in. And didn't see Radiohead there, though. He'd already done the bends by that time. Um, he was a fascinating person, very mild, mild character. Um, quite lovely, isn't he? And he's very smart and quite interesting, isn't he? Yeah, no, definitely. And um, I still like talking to him. Um, but yeah, I remember feeling quite scared around the last because <laughs> they used to fight each other, play pool. And I think, you know, and they were staying in the residential house there. Um, so they weren't having to drive home, put it that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did you feel part of that world, or, or you get to be because you have a open mind in pop terms? That's just another interesting area, you know, along with pop and rap and indie. I think you're all mm. interesting genres that are cross pollinating in your in your personal pop world. Oh, definitely. I would. Um, I mean. Gosh, when Stone Roses came out with Fool's Gold, that was just just brilliant. I played that song to death. And the fact that, you you know, it really made made me think that you can play instruments over breakbeats as well. Um, and and the Happy Mondays as well. You know, I just I was mad about them. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, 
it's weird because and the charlatans as well because everywhere I went actually those songs are kind of like a soundtrack to to the things I had to do so if I had to do a radio one road show or do some PAs in the club even they would play happy monday step on or fool's gold you know there was that crossover with club dance music and indie indie dance as well which I loved I thought it was that made it more interesting and those records they just you know they sound great still you know you hear them now and if in fact you know when, when whenever I DJ I play I play those songs as part of my set as well um and um but learning this new I'm learning um the the, the new technology <laughs> so it's so much easier than it used to be <laughs> oh it's more and easier yes yeah, great isn't it yeah. It's just with that indie dancing, because you're kind of approaching the same place from a different angle, aren't you? I mean, at the time, when I was writing about music, I could very much write about you in the context of people like the Mondays or the Shards. Or the but you come from a different angle. You come from, you know, uh, Shepherd's Bush, uh, hip-hop, food pop but ending up in the same place, kind of bubblegum, slightly psychedelic, slightly mm-hmm. larger-than-life pop music, pop culture. So I'm always, always interested in that. It's just like a, a collision coming from a different point. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, I mean, maybe it's because I was signed to an indie label and also the fact that um, I, I was a woman or girl who was um, making my own music in the bedroom. That was credible, I suppose. I wasn't, because the other, other female artists at that time were, were considered to be puppets, really. I'm signed to majors, and uh, they'd they'd have this standard issue of, um, you know, singing and then having some dancers in the background, and there'd be this standard video. Um, Mm -hmm. Whereas I just didn't want to be like that. And I think that probably, I think, and also I was on the front cover of the NME magazine. They came over to Chicago. Um, Who was it now? Steve... uh, He's passed away now, I think. Um, yes, Wells. Wells. Wells, that's it. And and um, what was the, the uh, Derek Ridges came over oh, yeah. to do the yeah. photos. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, those are the days where you know you were you'd have um, journalists follow you around and like royalty basically. <laughs> so they came on the same plane as me to Chicago and uh, followed me around and did the whole article on me in America and stuff like that. And uh, that was great. I really enjoyed that, actually. What, what, did, um, America, what did Americans make of you? <clears throat> did they understand you as being pop or did they, did they think oh, you're just a little bit too British? Or Yeah, there was a bit of that. But actually, Doing the Do was number one in uh, Billboard Hot 100. Um, and that was on a white label alone without any promo. Um, so in Clubland... I was really well received um, and I wasn't, I hadn't even signed a deal in America because in those days you'd have, you would sign to different territories. If you were signed to a mate into to, um, an indie label, you would find other, you probably know this, but you, you know, you'd get um, a label in different territories like North America, Europe, and blah, blah, blah. And I hadn't even signed a deal there. So they didn't manage to capitalize on it because it should have gone, from there, it should have gone into the top uh, 20 in the the, bill, the actual billboard charts. That was the next um, stage, but it didn't, it, it had fizzled out by the time I'd signed the deal. But still, it was, it was great. But there, like in America, there's always small pockets of like cool people that go like to do things that are cultured and things like that. So like you've got your New York, you've got your um, Chicago um, Los Angeles, um, and very rarely places in between. <laughs> you know, it's where, wherever, wherever there's club and culture and arts and things like that. So um, that's where I found my where you know I was well received and things. I enjoyed it. It was really good. Um, I think Salt Lake City quite liked me actually. I don't know why, but that's <laughs> our anomaly. <laughs> was this also the point in time when Madonna? Trying to sign into Maverick. Mm. Uh, well, she. This was. This was um, in 1994. So I'd already. I wasn't quite sure what I was doing anyway. Um, but she got in touch with me because she was working with um, Nelly Hooper, and Nelly Hooper was a friend of mine. That she was doing the bedtime bedtime stories album, I think. 
and um, she she said that she I'd always heard that she was a massive fan of mine because I was signed to Sire eventually like she was and Seymour Stein signed me and he signed her as well so he told me that she was a massive fan and and I'm and of course I just took it with a pinch of salt because again you know she's that character that you, she's untouchable you know you don't know mm. she could have said anything but um anyway so she got in touch with me because I was staying in New York and Nelly told her that I was staying at this hotel so she rung me up and said let's go out come over um let's talk um and uh yeah she wanted to sign me to Maverick because that was a new label right then because she just signed Alanis Morissette and Michelle Indiacello who's that I think she's a bass player um and I was going to be the next signing um but then that was really exciting actually because I just thought I couldn't believe it you know this is like uh, Madonna's my friend now <laughs> you know, how's, how's that happen um but yeah but then my mum fell sick and um and uh, I I wanted to look after her and sadly she passed away um and after that I just didn't really want to get back into the industry again I just it was just too um you know yeah probably suffering grief and things like that so you know trying to I, had to, I was the captain of the family. I had to look after my granny um, and things like that and uh, take care of her because she, she'd lost, already lost another daughter, my auntie. So we, it was a really sort of bad sort of family tragedy um, in my family. So, uh, but you have to be a certain way if you're going to be out there. You, you know, you're going to have to be able to take knocks and stuff like that and um, be criticised and... If you're if you're not in that place, it's, it's going to be hard. And um, besides, I just didn't have any time. I'd had to look after everybody, so <laughs> that's why I didn't sign the deal to Maverick. So that's a priority. Yeah, it's, that's that's right. That's the right decision, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I just didn't think anything of it. I just I'm not doing that. I'm not. You know, I just need to be with my family and take care of everyone. And yet the influence remained, didn't it? I mean, even though it's a fairly short pop career, you know, too too much of it, you know, hit there. Mm-hmm. But like I say, like, there is an influence on Madonna because Madonna did go into that kind of glammy space pop kind of phase. And yeah, you can't put your finger exactly on it, of course you can't, but you, sometimes like as as a neutral, the outside thinking, well, I wonder, I really wonder if that was that was where that came from. And also Spice Girls as well, didn't they? They're looking for five Betty Boos as the original templates of, of Spice Girls, aren't they? Yeah, well, I, I ended up working with um, Bob and Chris Herbert, who were um, a father and son management outfit. Bob's no, <coughs> excuse me, isn't with us anymore. He sadly passed away. But they discovered the Spice Girls. They auditioned them. I mean, that, you know, there's the famous kind of... Um, video that's that could be online I don't know if it is but um where they auditioned them at like a, a dance studio like pineapple somewhere um and they told me that they they were looking for five Betty Boos basically sassy kind of uh, with a bit of attitude larger than life you know that's probably what and that, it's not until that happened I realized that you know that it did have something special um what I did was somehow just happened and but it was people liked it and um yeah it's funny how what time does really it just helps you mm-hmm. analyze things a bit better <laughs> puts it in context that you're not actually too busy doing it you can actually look at it as a thing a separate thing yeah yeah you do actually because you know if you, you think about what you do on an ordinary day <laughs> it's like it's not i don't live in a spaceship people used to think i did <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's just, that's just <laughs> yeah i do i go around you know platform boots every day yeah that's me <laughs> and it's about the point in time i guess that you start the songwriter were you already writing songs for other people even in your pop career before that as well yeah i, I did a i did start, do some writing for other people and i liked it um did loads of it actually um i went to la did some stuff over there worked with the big hitters as it you know that you know people that were doing Beyonce records and stuff like that did some stuff with Greg Kirsten and it was just great experience working with these masters you know they they just know how to well you know if you enter a, 
a writing session with them, you know, often because you were booked in to work with them. It wouldn't be a case of, oh, let's start something and then finish it off, like whenever you're back or whenever you feel like it. You'd go in quite early, say 10 o'clock, 10.30, and finish something by five o'clock and it would sound like a record. You know, it's just how they do stuff over there is just mental. And I found it a bit, I don't know, I didn't like, it was too much pressure, <laughs> too much pressure. And also if I had any nice ideas, I wanted to keep them for myself anyway. So <laughs> yeah, I got the second, second hand ideas. I mean, that, how the process work? I mean, you'd go in the room and they'd have the beats and you'd sit there and just sing ideas and the melody ideas that the beats would suggest. Like you write yourself or is it a very, I mean, I've heard lots of different ways about pop writing, you know, some in New York mm. writes a drum beat, some in writes a top line in Paris, mm. and somebody does a bass line in LA. Is it a combination of those things? Um, well, the, the best, the best um, experiences I had doing that kind of writing was have, making sure you had ideas like titles and concepts and things like that. And it would be a very conventional way of writing because um, that was the best way, really. Um, and often, you know, you, you might work with an artist that's there and that would be easier because you could bounce off them and get into whoever they were, you know, their sort of way of performing and that would be easier. Um, and sometimes you'd write with them as well because, you know, sometimes they could come up with good ideas as well. Um, but, yeah, it was a very different way of writing. It was almost, I'd say, yeah, it was a great experience. I, don't, I you know, I'm not sure if I'd go back there, though, um because it nearly it nearly killed me I was just like oh my god can I do this um a bit soul destroying sometimes because you know you might do something and then the record label for that artist might reject it and I just thought I, this is not why I started doing this in the first place you know there are people that are so good at it and they can just do stuff like I mean some people other writers I knew were doing four or five sessions a day with different people just to increase their chances. And, you know, and A&R people at that, at that time, I used to think, you know, it was all a kind of like pick and mix A&R. It was, it's nothing really, they put artists out to see what they came up with, with different writers and throw money at it. And then, you know, they might end up with a hundred songs, but then choose 10 or 12. And if you're lucky, you know, you might get a, like a bonus <laughs> track or something. I just thought, oh God, you know, I'd rather be in control of my own destiny and do this. But I, I mean, if somebody wanted me to help them with stuff and I, I thought I could help, I would do it definitely. But this was just a bit like, sometimes I felt it, it was a bit like um, going on a blind date or something. Not that I ever, ever, ever went on a blind date, but if you were working with a producer that you'd never met before, you don't know what they were like. You know, you don't, you, I, I mean, I worked with one producer, it's, it was horrible. I just, I thought, he made me cry, actually. I just like, thought I'm never going to work with people like that ever again. Um, but, you know, I don't know if it was the American way <laughs> or, or, or me just, <laughs> I'm just too, I'm too sensitive. Um, I'm not made of, uh, I haven't got, you know, elephant skin. I'm, you know, Which actually yeah. makes better pop music to be like that and you actually wrote hits as well I mean, you actually you did write several hits but was that going back to the UK and going back to the way you like to write you know see hits for girls allowed mm -hmm. in here say was that just you writing a song presenting it to them or how is that a different process well that's a different process as well because um and much easier in a way because I was co-writing with people that I knew so for girls allowed for instance I worked with well, I wrote the top lines of everything, but the Beatmasters did the beats and the music. Um, and with Pure and Simple for Hearsay, for instance, I worked with two other writers um, and I got on really well with them. So it, was, it wasn't, nothing was, that was all fun. Um, and uh, also I've worked with Paloma Faith and she's a really good art artist, you know, really knows what she wants and everything. And that Again, that's enjoyable because you you, you reach a, a place where you you're all really happy with the outcome and um, and uh, yeah, that's I much I preferred writing here than in the states. That's for sure. It does just like with the girls allowed tracks because it just sound like your tracks. It's just done by somebody else. Uh, so, so 
I mean, that, that those could be Betty Bean tracks, couldn't they? Sort of hidden away on a, another artist's record. Yeah, they, they, yeah. I mean, they kind of wanted at the beginning, actually, when um, when they first won that um, Pop Stars Arrivals, I think it was. Um, that they were kind of wanting something like Betty Boo because that's what the A&R man told me. But then it just, I think, uh, what's the names? Uh, Metrophonic Brian Higgins lot um, got involved. And that their sound evolved, and that's where he, they, he just took over, and they, they did stuff with him. So, um, but that made sense because it sounded they got their sound, they've got their sound, and um, and it's better suited to them, I think. Was that that was Zenomania? Is it called? <laughs> yeah, Zenomania. Yeah. yeah, I think the studio is called. Oh yeah, that's it, Zenomania. That's it. So I got yeah. it mixed up with somebody else. <laughs> They're really great writers, aren't they? They write really great. Quite dark pop music, actually, quite captivating. Yeah. Music. yeah, yeah, no, definitely. But there was, they, um, I think, the way they write is they have a load of people um, coming in and chipping away at different parts and different stages of the songs, and you know, it's the way they like to write and stuff. And um, but what what the outcome is is that they've got something that is unique to that group, and it's it's a really good sound. So, so why did you stop writing for the people? Did you just just run out of tunes? I mean, of course. It's only a fine amount of tunes, or, or yeah. you just get distracted by life. I mean, you, you had like the family issues yeah. as well. So, yeah. Um, I, I just, I just thought it was. Um, I, I don't know. I just, I didn't really enjoy it anymore. It wasn't really a job, you know. It's supposed to, if you're going to have a job, you just need to enjoy it or at least be paid for it. Mm. And. A lot of things. I mean, I worked with this group once, and uh, I helped mentor them and stuff like that. And the and I wrote a song, co-wrote a song, and they said that the record they were saying, the record label um, that they signed to, was signed based on the song that I'd written for them because they were able to showcase how great they were. Um, so the record label signed them for quite a lot of money. I didn't get anything or anything like that. Not that I wanted anything, but it was just, well, you know, if I write something, perhaps, you know, you get involved um, in the process of making more records for them. You know, that's the kind of, that's the idea anyway. Um, but they just put my tunes up on on YouTube or on their website without asking me, which completely devalues your copyright. And I was horrified by that because they were just... They just weren't respecting somebody's music and, and their copyrights. And, um, and that was the nature of the business at the time. I used to think they didn't ask my permission. Um, and I thought, this is bullshit. <laughs> I'm fucking off now. I'm going to do something else. And I've taken up tennis and um, play tennis instead. I should be probably be a coach by now. <laughs> Bring it full circle. Now, yeah. now you're back. I mean, what, what plans are there? I mean, is this purely, um, not obviously not a hobby, but a hobby plus, you know, just write these songs, see what happens. Mm. Pop landscape is completely different now. Mm. I mean, how, how, do you, how do you even see how you fit into the current pop landscape? It's, it's an utterly different world than the one you left, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, it's like being a new artist, I suppose. And, you know, for me, I don't really... I don't want the world, you know, I'm not going, I want to, you know, I'm realistic. I'm, I can't compete with uh, all the young artists that are signed to major labels and that kind of stuff. Um, because, you know, when it comes to radio stations and things like that, they're, uh, you know, they're going to play them first because there's always, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if this happens, <laughs> but, you know, there must be trade-offs for the radio stations and things saying, well, you know, maybe that person we won't give you that person if you don't play this person <laughs> you know I don't know because I don't know if that happens uh, yeah, you know but I know that I like to as, as long as I'm happy with what I've done um, I'm happy and and I'm you know there are some there's some fans out there that really love what I do and I, I'd like to just make music for them and for myself and it's an it's nice to have a bit of my job back, you know, not like I don't, I don't feel like, you know, I don't want world domination, you know, it's not going to happen really. I just want to just 
make my music and um, and do it for as long as I can. Um, but I used to think that my age would hold, hold me back a bit. Um, but having said that, I just thought, hang on a minute, just because I'm a woman and I'm like in my fifth, well, I'm 52 next month, why, why should that stop you? Why, why should it? I mean, Rick Astley's doing it um, and Banana Armour are doing it. Um, Rolling Stones are doing it. <laughs> why not me? <laughs> it's inspiring, isn't it? You know, people knock Madonna and go on the mm. stage at her age, but actually that's probably one of the best things about her these days, the defiance of ageing, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Why should it matter? Um, and, you know, it's... it's um, I don't know. I, I'm really happy with myself and in within myself. I'm conf, quietly confident, you know, better better than I was. Uh, you know, it's it is quite a big deal to come back. And, you know, you get people that are just going to be horrible anyway, aren't you? And it's a different it's a different world. You know, people could just say on your Facebook official page, thinking that you're not going to see it. I mean, I get lots, so much love from people. It's so it's, I'm really like touched and, but you get somebody that all might go, oh, fuck off, you know, <laughs> go away. Or it's like, why did you, why did you go on my Facebook page and write that? There must be something really wrong with you. It's like, go, go somewhere else. <laughs> it's something wrong with them, not with you, of course. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually none of their business. <laughs> yeah I think that it's like some people just want a reaction and um and yeah. I'm just not going to do it so but no overwhelmingly it's been great I, I really it's been great it really has so are you planning to tour it and I mean I know you play you play some festivals but is it, mm-hmm. you play to, and how would you tour would you go back to like an updated version of what you were doing before are we, are we going to go back into outer space glam space again or <laughs> Um, hopefully not a too mature version (laughs) i'd love to you know what i'd really love to go proper like spacey and stuff like that um i what i want to do is put put out a few more singles and put out an album before uh, the summer or early summer and and then i'll do these festivals i've got loads of festivals lined up actually and hoping that you know maybe I'll do a tour of my own we'll see how it goes really um but I definitely want to perform my new stuff and um get a little production going um yeah we'll just see I've only just started it's only been like three weeks since I put the single out so but lots of um (laughs) it is a bit it is like being catapulted into it but you're not doing it in the way that you used to do it so for instance you just put your record out or you build it up with socials and stuff like that because there's a way of getting some kind of impact. Um, but in the old days, you know, you'd have a, a white label, like for instance, doing the do, we, we mailed out white labels to the DJs um, and then that would take about a week and then you'd have to wait a week for their response or their reaction and they'd post them back to you. I mean, <laughs> you know how it, how it probably worked. Um, and then you'd have my record label made me read all the reactions <laughs> of, the club, of people on the dance floor like you'd get some people saying oh it just it didn't work it fell flat on its face or this was a banger um but that process you know and making sure that there was heat in the clubs first and then you'd see if radio one would play your record and that would take another couple of weeks and then if they did and then you'd try and build some tvs around it so you could get the chart show and then hopefully get into the top 40 on top of the pops and then you'd slowly climb up the charts every week and then you'd pepper it with performances and um and going on shows like Richard and Judy or something in the week to keep the interest up um and that whole process took months but now it's like you put it out there and people could say they like it and you know it's a quick process and I think for me I'd love to just just keep putting music out and just, you know, you only live once, don't you? 